All right, well, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully you've got your coffee close at hand as uh, we get started this morning. Uh, let me welcome you to this session uh, on behalf of my co-presenters and myself. Uh, I'm Greg Von Lehman, Special Assistant for Cybersecurity at University of Maryland Global Campus. And I'm joining two of my colleagues, as you can see, uh, Michael Garcia, who is the Senior Policy Advisor for National Security at Third Way, uh, a think tank in Washington, and Marcus Rauschecker, Cybersecurity Program Director at the University of Maryland Center for Health uh, and Homeland Security. So uh, to our topic, uh, an analysis of uh, federal and state legislation, uh, Michael will walk us through uh, the legislative activity in the last Congress. Uh, yours truly here uh, will review the legislative activity uh, at the state level for the 2020 year. And uh, Marcus will discuss bills in the Maryland General Assembly for uh, its current session. Um, we'll try to be disciplined. Uh, each of us uh, hope to take no more than 15 minutes. Um, we'll then have um, about uh, five to 10 minutes uh, for chat. We look forward to your questions uh, in the chat. And if we have time, we'd like to conclude with a, uh, a lightning round on the question of preemption. Uh, that is the question of how likely is it that Congress will preempt state legislation in the cybersecurity policy arena. So uh, with that introduction, uh, I'll turn it over to Michael, who will take us through the last Congress. Michael? Great. Thanks for the intro, Greg. Um, it's, it's great to be here. really wish uh, we could do this in person, but hopefully someday pretty soon. Um, as Greg mentioned, my name is Michael Garcia. I'm a senior policy advisor for Third Way, where I work on their cyber enforcement initiative. Uh, I've been with Third Way for about a year now, uh, but prior to Third Way, I was uh, with the U.S. Cyberspace SLAM Commission, where I helped them develop a series of policies and recommendations to help improve our U.S. cyber deterrence strategy. Uh, prior to that, I actually worked very closely at the state level or at the National Governors Association, where I traveled across the country to advise governor's offices on developing policies and legislations and uh, executive orders um, related to cybersecurity technology and other homeland security issues. Um, and so I come at this issue where I have a good nexus between understanding what happens at the state level as well as what happens at the federal level. And I came to Third Way to help them uh, bridge that divide, if you will. And a little bit about our program is that we really focus a lot on cybercrime issues, um, realizing that a lot of folks touch on issues related to defending IoT devices and the information communication technologies where our internet communications uh, diverse, as well as looking at some of the military and foreign policy domain we saw an issue area where we should really center on uh, cybercrime and criminal justice. So we do a lot of issues related to that, but our primary audience is members of Congress and staffers on the Hill. So we do a lot of work uh, with that. Um, for that, uh, Greg, I'm getting some feedback. I think if you mute yourself, that might help. Um, there we go. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we released a paper early this January that looked at all the cybersecurity related legislation that was passed and, or passed and introduced in the 116th Congress. Uh, we did a very similar paper back in 2019 where one of my former colleagues did the exact same thing. And so we thought we could do a trend analysis. Uh, you can find the paper online, which I'm, I'm happy to share after this conversation. And there's a lot of interesting data to be pulled from that. And I was really happy that we were able to put our raw database on there so you could look at all 316 bills and perform a lot of interesting analysis because there's a lot of variables that you can play around with. But there's really three main takeaways that I want to uh, share with you all today. First, uh, Congress has uh, increased by 40% the amount of cyber related legislation that they introduced in the 116th Congress and over 50% of them had bipartisan co-sponsors. And of the 14 that passed, around 80% or a little over 80% of them had bipartisan uh, co-sponsorship. So what this means is that while we, we know that uh, bipartisanship is rare nowadays, at least in the cybersecurity context, it's actually quite high. And there is a lot of uh, cross-aisle negotiations when it comes to cybersecurity. As you can see on the graph here, 
the yellow is the bills that were uh, introduced in 116th. And uh, probably not surprisingly, but a lot dealt with protecting government infrastructure, uh, critical infrastructure, including that at the state and local level, uh, issues related to foreign policies, breach notification, consumer protection, and a lot of bills, uh, pretty pretty obvious, I'd imagine, is regarding appropriations. And then leading up to 2020 elections, a lot of bills uh, proposed about election security. Uh, of the 316 bills, only 14 were signed into law, but that's a bit of a misnomer, and I, I want to take time to break that down. Of the 14 bills, a majority of them were appropriations or authorization bills, like the annual National Defense Authorization Act, which is the bill that authorizes and provides funds to DOD and DOD-type uh, assets and national security missions. Uh, Congress attached 45 previously introduced bills into these larger appropriation vehicles, like the NDAA. And in fact, the NDAA had 32 of those bills. Yet that only tells part of the story. And I'm actually about to release a paper here in the next week or so that delves in further into the NDAA to show that even though only 14 bills were passed and 45 of independent bills were attached to those 14 bills, within the NDAAs alone and the 116th the FY 2020 and FY 2021 NDA, there were almost 200 cyber revisions within them, a lot of which obviously were not uh, previously introduced. So you have a, a, a massive bill that has a lot of cyber revisions in there that affects state and locals. I think case in point, uh, there was a lot of bills this past NDAA that further empowered CISA, such as providing a CISA state coordinator in each and every state. I know that the acting CISA director, uh, sorry, I'll pause. CISA is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, which is based out of uh, DHS, which is really focused on uh, protecting critical infrastructure uh, and working with state and local partners, just to clarify. Um, but like I said, they have CISA coordinators now in each of the 55 state and territories. So that's just a example of how the NDAA is impacting state and locals and it's short morphing beyond its typical remit of just DOD type activities. Uh, however, we found that only 36 of the 316 bills introduced and only three of the 14 bills that are signed to law focus on imposing consequences on the actors behind these cyber attacks. And what I mean by that is that it's the cost imposition, it's the consequences of uh, the perpetrators of causing the attack. So what this means are bills related to providing state and local resources to improve, say, their digital forensic capabilities to analyze evidence at the scene of a cybercrime, uh, working with our international allies to go after criminals who reside in their uh, borders, or imposing sanctions on nation state adversaries who might be abetting or aiding criminals with, within their territories. Uh, so unfortunately, that has not been a, a, a key priority for Congress. Uh, but we're hoping that does change. The three bills that were passed related to that, two of which were the NDAAs, and one of which was making it a felony to hack into the election systems. And so while this really shows the kind of authorities that Congress wants to uh, empower the federal government to do, uh, the other side of the coin is the resources. And this is where I kind of want to talk about now, and that we did a huge paper that looked at cybersecurity grants that are available to state and locals. And I know it's been a conversation we've been having for quite some time, especially for the need to have our, our own cybersecurity grant for state and locals. What I did was I examined grants that were that could be used for cybercrime, but for all intents and purposes, these could be used for other cybersecurity purposes. So once again, we did a, a big paper that came out in February um, there's a lot of data you could pull from it, but there's three points I just want to highlight real quickly. So we analyzed um, all DHS and DOJ grants that could be used for cybersecurity purposes and found that at least 11 grants uh, in, in FY 2019 totaled $1.8 billion that state and locals or nonprofits assisting state and locals could be used for cybercrime uh, purposes. And I, I emphasize could because this doesn't mean that that's $1.8 billion that's being spent on cyber, is that that's a total pool that could be uh, pulled down from. However, when we're trying to distill how much of these grants are actually used for cybersecurity or cybercrime, it's actually very difficult. Either the federal government doesn't collect it or they don't necessarily uh, publicize it. And I think it's more of the former than the latter, unfortunately. Uh, but there are a few key data points that we found to show that not a lot is being spent on cyber, nor is it really being prioritized. So my second point is that only three DOJ grants in FY 2019 
were solely dedicated to cybercrime purposes, such as buying digital forensic tools or hiring personnel, but total budget at $12.7 million. Uh, so you look at the FY2019 column, I know it's a, it's a little small text, but the last two rows are grants dedicated to cybercrime purposes. And then the Economic High Technology White Collar Grant is a grant that's provided to a nonprofit called the uh, National White Collar Crime Center or NW3C, which I, I'm sure some of you all have heard of. Uh, that's a nonprofit that helps trains and assists state, federal, and local law enforcement officials when it comes to uh, investigating cybercrime. Uh, so $12.7 million across 55 states and territories, uh, across 18,000 law enforcement agencies, it's not a lot. Um, and also we found that DOJ doesn't prioritize cybercrime uh, amongst its largest grant. If you look at the very top there, it's the fourth row, the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant, or Byrne JAG, as it's uh, colloquially called. Uh, the Attorney General could request that a carve-out be made for a specific area, or... Uh, not require, but ask that grantees spend part of their grants on a priority area. Since FY 2017, cyber and cybercrime has not been designated as a carve out or a priority area. Further, uh, only 2% of all DHS preparedness grants were used for all cybersecurity needs in FY 2019. Now, I'll pull this down a little bit because I think it's really important because I know a lot of states uh, rely on the Homeland Security Grant Program. So, starting in, I believe, FY 2018, FEMA said, that you must spend 5%, at least 5% of your grant on cybersecurity purposes, mainly to protect critical infrastructure, but it could be used to say by computer forensic capabilities to analyze uh, evidence at the scene of a crime. Uh, Secretary Mayork has made a, a lot of waves when he came in, uh, Secretary of DHS, and he said that we're gonna boom, bump that 5% to 7.5%, increasing it to a total of $25 million, or I should say an increase of $25 million, which is all, well and good, but that means only about now three-ish percent to four percent of all DHS preparedness grants are spent on cybersecurity. Yet we know that we're getting hit massively with ransomware. And McAfee and another think tank did a, a, a study that showed that from FY 2018 to FY 2021, uh, cybercrime cost the global economy over a trillion dollars. And so we're really throwing pennies at a trillion dollar issue set. And I still believe that there needs to be a dedicated cyber program that state and locals could use for this. Uh, but we have a series of recommendations on how these grants could be leveraged uh, to help states uh, further improve their capabilities and capacities. And before I turn to Greg, I'll just end with, I'm really optimistic that the 117th Congress will do a lot on cybersecurity uh, for the main reason being that after the SolarWinds hack, after the Microsoft exchange vulnerabilities uh, from their servers, as well as just the massive ransomware that's impacting essentially every congressional district, there's a lot of pressure on members to act. And since they've been increasing in their comfortability in introducing legislation and it's bipartisan issue, I'm, I'm really confident that uh, some significant cyber bills can come to fruition uh, this Congress. So with that, uh, I'll pass it over back to you, you Greg. You're on uh, mute, Greg. Uh, so it was a terrific presentation, Michael, and I think um, your, uh, your presentation will occasion a, a good number of questions in the chat. So let me start with um, this slide and this quote. Um, there will be greater recognition of state, local, territorial, and tribal government's role in the nation's cybersecurity efforts. Now that quote is in the future tense, but actually I think that time is now. Um, uh, it's certainly true of the publics uh, within the states who are asking their elected representatives to address a range of cybersecurity issues of concern. Uh, this slide captures the trend uh, since 2016. So the blue bars represent bills that have been uh, or were introduced in the 2020 session, introduced and considered in state legislatures. Uh, and the red bars represent uh, the bills that were actually passed. And uh, let me mention uh, that my source for these data is the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, which, as many of you know, uh, does a legislative roundup uh, within various policy areas at the end of each year. Now, when you look at the trend from 2016 to 2019, and then you compare um, 
2019 and 2020, it's, it's obvious that COVID had an impact on the 2020 session. Uh, COVID uh, shortened legislative sessions significantly, impacting the overall number of bills that were passed, uh, including the number of uh, cyber-related bills. And my hunch is uh, that in 2022, um, we will resume the uh, upward march in cybersecurity bills uh, that are, are proposed and passed. Uh, this uh, slide breaks down um, the 2020 sessions. Um, uh, you can see the buckets uh, that I use there. Um, a number of states passed bills that would establish uh, commissions or task forces that would uh, study um, uh, a particular cybersecurity issue uh, related to the state. There were bills that um, uh, concerned uh, cyber workforce development, uh, changes in the criminal law. There were bills directed at state and local uh, cybersecurity, um, uh, as well as the others uh, that you can see there. And I'll, I'll just uh, uh, note that um, uh, apart from bills directed at state government, uh, bills that were concerned with uh, consumer protection uh, uh, was the second uh, highest category. Now the question is, um, is there any way we can chunk uh, these data uh, to more clearly see uh, what the emphasis is, and I think we can. Um, these three categories, I think, uh, do a good job of accounting for uh, most of the data. Uh, there are bills, uh, first of all, that are directed at, at government itself. Uh, this is the largest category, 59% of, uh, of cyber-related bills in 2020. There are bills that, that are concerned with consumer protection, um, which is the next largest category of 17%. Uh, and then bills that address other critical infrastructure. Um, it's only 6% of the total cyber-related bills, but it is the third largest uh, as we group the data uh, in this way. Um, so to uh, uh, hit the treetops, um, uh, first of all, to look at state and local government, uh, it's not surprising uh, if you look at the chart on the left, uh, that funding is at the top of the list of state government bills. Um, I was very interested in Michael's comments about uh, grants. I actually wasn't uh, aware that so much was available, at least in the area of law enforcement. Uh, but the need for money is a consistent theme uh, uh, at the state level uh, in discussions about cybersecurity. In fact, in the, the, NAS the NASIO biennial reports, it's always at the top of the list, if not within the, in the top three. Uh, so budgets are tight. Uh, getting appropriations uh, is competitive. Uh, consequently, I was really interested to see some states look to other ways to fund cybersecurity needs. Um, for example, there was, a, there was one of the bills in one of the states would allow state courts uh, to charge a fee that would be uh, dedicated to their cybersecurity needs. Uh, and in another state, uh, there was a bill that would uh, actually in several states, there were bills that would empower the Secretary of State to charge a fee for uh, the cybersecurity of their IT systems, uh, including um, election infrastructure. And then uh, again, still on the, the state government chart to the left, um, you see the bar for best practices. And here we're concerned with uh, bills that would mandate risk assessments, bills that would uh, mandate standards for the evaluation of open source software, um, statewide security standards uh, and protocols, training, data minimization, the list goes on. Uh, and you know, one question I ask myself is, why do you have state legislatures uh, proposing bills to do things that you would expect a state CIO or a state CISO would do on their own? Um, well, uh, the answer is um, that uh, state departments uh, typically have a, a, their own statutory basis, uh, and uh, which creates kind of a balkanized um, uh, structure of state government. Uh, and so this really makes it difficult uh, for uh, state CIOs or CISOs uh, to uh, employ kind of enterprise level direction when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. And then shifting to the, the chart on the right, uh, and just to be clear, uh, we're concerned here with state bills, state uh, bills that are directed at local government. Um, the big point I want to make is um, they reflect a concern that 
uh, local governments simply do not have the resources or the expertise to effectively provide for their cybersecurity. If you spend any time looking at um, uh, state audits of local governments, including school districts, or, or you look at independent reports like the, the, the NASIO series of reports, uh, this concern with uh, state government is prominent. So it's not surprising that you have bills trying to, to do something there. Uh, election security, big surprise, right? Um, the, the best practice bills uh, that you see there on the, the left, um, they concern the election security, election uh, security pressure points, um, security assessment of equipment, uh, protocols for managing the voter registration database. So we're concerned with um, you know, uh, adding and deleting voters uh, and the requirements of networks used to transmit election data and of course training. Uh, and just a couple of highlights, uh, several of the bills uh, in this category uh, provided for state evaluation of blockchain uh, to record votes in a secure manner. Uh, and the three policy change bills um, would uh, either restrict uh, absentee or fax voting, which we know is uh, are rife with uh, security issues, or it would require the re replacement of existing election systems with paper ballots and scanners, which we know as the gold standard really in um, uh, election uh, systems. <clears throat> the four bills that passed, uh, two require cybersecurity training and two require a relationship of state boards of election with um, a threat intelligence agency. And this could be a, a fusion center uh, or it could be a, a private vendor uh, that provides uh, threat intelligence. <clears throat> Looking at uh, incident response units uh, on the right there, uh, we know that states are understaffed uh, with cybersecurity talent, so they continue to look for ways to augment uh, their response capacities. Uh, and this is typically through cyber militias or volunteers uh, that would operate under various uh, reporting arrangements, whether it would be the Agent and General's Office, uh, the state CIO, or some other department. Um, <clears throat> the four bills uh, that concern law and emergency management uh, recognize a connection between IT and OT, uh, the fact that cyber attacks can cause disasters that are as bad as floods, um, storms, or wildfires. And uh, accordingly, uh, the bills uh, in this case aim to change the definition of disaster in emergency management law to include cyber-induced disasters so that uh, emergency management resources could be activated uh, in such cases. Um, excuse me, so um, uh, Michael spent a good bit of time talking about um, uh, law enforcement and grants that are available. Um, uh, the um, uh, uh, state populations basically are swamped in cyber crime. Um, you can just look at the, uh, the FBI internet crime reports to see that graphically. Um, so there are state bills uh, that are meant to increase uh, the state's capacity to impose costs on criminals. Basically, there are three strategies that I noticed in these bills. Uh, one is simply increased penalties for existing computer crimes. Uh, a second is defining new crimes. Uh, cyber terrorism is one. Uh, one that I really stuck out to me is uh, the crime of phishing in the first, second, and third degree, uh, computer trespass, uh, making good use of a, a common law concept, uh, and then making the possession of malware or ransomware in itself uh, a crime with certain exceptions, um, uh, such as uh, the possession to do research. And the third strategy is uh, increasing investigative capacity for uh, cybercrime. Uh, the six bills uh, that you see there to the right uh, would either invest investigative authority in an existing agency. There was a Georgia bill that would do this with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or it would create a new crime unit wholly dedicated to, um, to cyber crime. So consumer protection. Um, if you recall, uh, consumer protection bills accounted for um, about one in five of all cyber uh, related bills in 2020, and this is not surprising. Uh, Pew research polls consistently show uh, uh, concern among US adults about data collection, how their data is used and shared, 
uh, and their lack of confidence uh, in the ability of private business and government to protect their data. So looking at the largest uh, group of bills uh, to the far left, security requirements for firms, um, 24 of these bills uh, targeted um, firms that, that are uh, data rich in PII, that's data brokers, uh, insurance firms, financial firms, credit reporting agencies. Uh, there was one bill that actually included utilities with a concern for smart meter data. Uh, and uh, for the most part, these bills follow examples of the, uh, the New York financial law that was passed a couple of years ago, the data brokers law in Vermont uh, and other states in previous years. Uh, six of the bills in this category did not apply to any particular uh, business sector, and they relied more on the carrot rather than the stick, uh, providing an, in an incentive, namely safe harbor, uh, to firms to uh, implement cybersecurity uh, measures. Uh, the six breach notification bills either extended breach reporting requirements to additional firms uh, or updated protected uh, information definitions, biometric uh, data, geolocation data, and so forth. We know the law is always chasing technology. And there was one bill uh, that aimed to replicate uh, the California Consumer Protection Act, um, uh, uh, um, and that was the state of Maryland. And I think that uh, this issue, consumer control of uh, their data, uh, is one that's only going to grow, uh, and I, I expect we'll see more bills um, uh, across the state landscape uh, in the years ahead. Uh, uh, critical infrastructure, states are waking up to the fact that uh, they have some leverage when it comes to energy and water uh, security. This is not simply um, a federal issue. Um, the cybersecurity energy bills that you see there uh, focus on the oversight role of the public service commissions, um, you know, which are the rate approvers uh, for utilities. And they also provide some attention to statewide uh, strategic planning with a view to resiliency. Uh, the water bills would require that uh, water service providers uh, have a cybersecurity program and also provision for enhanced uh, physical security. And I think it'll be interesting to see in light of all the uh, press about the um, the hacking of uh, the water service provider in Florida, whether there'll be a surge in, in water uh, security bills in the 2022 year. Of the three bills that passed in 2020, um, one, it was a, one Florida bill uh, provided funding to upgrade uh, SCADA devices uh, at a Florida port. Um, there was a, uh, a Maryland bill that uh, made provision for cybersecurity standards for 911 digital systems. And, um, and then there was a Missouri law uh, that required um, water providers within the state to, to actually have and implement a cybersecurity plan. So uh, that's my roundup uh, for 2020 and uh, maybe it provides a good context uh, for Marcus. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Greg, and good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, uh, as Greg said in the introduction, my name is Marcus Rauschicker. I'm the Cybersecurity Program Director at the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. We are a nonprofit consulting group that's closely affiliated with the Maryland School of Law. And we work with clients, uh, predominantly state and local clients, actually, um, to uh, help them prepare for and respond to any kind of disaster. Uh, so we do a lot of emergency management planning, but we also do a lot of cybersecurity uh, assistance. And um, when I talk about cybersecurity, we really focus on the legal and the policy issues with, within cybersecurity. So um, you know, we, we recognized a long time ago that cybersecurity is not just a technical issue, but also has significant legal and policy implications. And that's really our bread and butter at the center. So um, I uh, want to augment what Michael and Greg have been talking about so far and take a closer look at what, what is happening specifically in Maryland. And you'll see that a lot of uh, the things that Michael and Greg have talked about already in terms of what's happening at the national level is really happening here in Maryland as well. And um, what I'm going to do is talk generally about uh, the legislation that we've seen during this uh, legislative session in Maryland, and then highlight three bills, which I think are uh, really important to look at and really exemplify, um, you know, the larger trend of what's happening in the field of cybersecurity law, uh, but also um, the potential beneficial impact that these uh, bills could have if they were to become law. 
So if we take a look at, um, at this uh, leg current legislative session in Maryland, uh, we see that there's actually 18 cyber related bills that had been introduced in this session. Uh, and these bills uh, range in what they're seeking to address from criminal law to consumer protection, uh, general cyber preparedness and incident response. We have bills that are dedicated to improving cyber governance, cyber governance within the state and developing cyber education and workforce uh, uh, for, for the state, and then also voting security. So, you know, these categories of laws that we're seeing in Maryland closely, I think, resemble what we're seeing again at the national level. Um, if we just recall what Greg just went through, you know, he talked about these types of laws, these types of bills being introduced across the country, and we're seeing the same type of laws um, being introduced here in Maryland. Now, the last thing I'll say, my general comments here is that, you know, we see 18 cyber related bills being introduced this legislative session. That, uh, that indicates a general increase. We've seen an increase in the number of bills introduced in the legislative session in Maryland every, year over year. And, um, you know, we saw that in the graphics at the national level again in the prior uh, presentations but it's really true here in Maryland as well. And that's just a reflection of how important this area really is, uh, how many challenges there are in terms of in the cybersecurity field and the need to address those challenges uh, through legislation. So um, it's just the trend that we're seeing across the nation and here in Maryland that we're seeing more and more people concerned with uh, cybersecurity, obviously, and more and more legislators trying to address those concerns through, through law. So as I mentioned, I wanna highlight uh, three specific bills here in Maryland that have been introduced in this legislative session. Uh, one is a criminal law or a law that would amend criminal, criminal existing criminal law to address uh, the problem of ransomware. Then I wanna to move towards a law that addresses cyber governance and strategy for the state of Maryland. And finally, I wanna talk about a law that would address online consumer protection for Maryland consumers. So SB 623, Criminal Law Crimes Involving Computers, is a law that would amend criminal, existing criminal law to prohibit a person from knowingly possessing ransomware malware with the intent to use it. I'm pretty sure everyone here is familiar with the ransomware threat. Uh, we know that in general, cybercrime is the fastest growing area of crime, um, but ransomware specifically has seen an upward trend over the recent years. And it's very concerning, obviously, when um, victims are prevented by hackers from accessing their own data and only um, get access to that data once they pay a ransom. And this has been a form of cybercrime that's growing uh, like crazy and unfortunately hitting all kinds of victims uh, from individuals to state and local governments to healthcare facilities, uh, as well as public schools. We know that here in Maryland, we're not immune to these types of attacks. And we, I think, are all familiar with the Baltimore City ransomware attack in 2019. And then more recently, Baltimore County Public Schools was hit with a ransomware attack just at the end of last year. So it is definitely a concern here in Maryland as well. So this bill was introduced to try to uh, address the problem of ransomware. And in essence, it creates an additional deterrent against um, criminals who would like to, who are thinking about using ransomware and launching ransomware attacks. Um, because again, this bill would make the actual possession of the software uh, a crime. Uh, that means that someone could be found guilty of a crime if they just have the ransomware software on the computer with the intent to use it. And law enforcement doesn't actually have to wait until uh, the criminal uh, deploys that ransomware and starts attacking victims with that ransomware software. Uh, this is a this law mirrors something that Michigan did a few years ago. They passed a similar law where they made the possession of ransomware malware illegal. And again, it's I think it's meant as a, a clear deterrent to anyone who's thinking about uh, using ransomware. Uh, in addition to just making that possession illegal, uh, the law also increases penalties for committing ransomware offenses against healthcare facilities or public schools. Again, this is a reflection of uh, trends we're unfortunately seeing where ransomware attacks are being launched against 
uh, healthcare facilities and and school systems. Um, of course, um, the attacks on healthcare facilities are especially concerning because you could literally have lives at uh, uh, at risk if a hospital is, for example, attacked and the hospital and the pro healthcare providers no longer have access to healthcare electronic healthcare records. Uh, that could mean uh, potential. Um, dire consequences. So very much concerned about these types of attacks and the penalties for those types of attacks are would be increased under this bill. Um, you see at the top of the slide, there's a little graphic there that I included um, to tell you, show you how far along this bill is in the legislative process. And we actually just had a crossover date in the Maryland legislature on Monday of this week, which means that's the date by which a, a bill would have to pass one side of the legislature and uh, move over and cross over, uh, if you will, to the other side of the legislature. Uh, if it hasn't crossed over uh, by now or by Monday, um, then the chances of the law of bill becoming law are pretty much over. But in, you see in this case, um, the the bill has a crossed over and um, and it's on its way to um, becoming law. I think there's a lot of support for this bill in the current legislative session. I think you know there's a general recognition that more needs to be done in terms of ransomware and, and, and preventing ransomware attacks. So uh, this is a bill that I think um, has a good chance of becoming law. And you know I think anything that can be done uh, to try to address this problem of ransomware is is a uh, is a uh, is a you know something that that should be taken very seriously and should be hopefully um, you know hopefully will become law because obviously we we need to do more. So moving along, um, I want to talk about another law that I think is has going to have a huge impact or another bill that could have a huge impact if it becomes law, which is the Cybersecurity Co Coordination and Operations uh, Bill. Uh, this is a bill that, uh, again, addresses would address Maryland um, uh, the Maryland strategic approach to cybersecurity and its general uh, ability to prepare for and respond to cyber incidents. So, under this bill, um, the there would be an office of security management established within the Maryland Department of Information Technology, as well, and it was also codify a Maryland Cybersecurity Coordinate, Coordinating Council. Both of these entities would be responsible for uh, providing strategy or establishing strategy for the state in terms of how the state as a whole would address cybersecurity issues, how the state would prepare for those, those challenges, and how the state would respond to those challenges. Um, as you can see on the slide here, there would be a lot of uh, various requirements that would be part of the law. Uh, ranging from compliance requirements and uh, requirements to implement certain cybersecurity standards and guidelines and policies, which all would seek to better prepare, um, you know, state and local entities for cybersecurity challenges. The the thing I want to highlight here, and this is something that both Michael and Greg have, uh, you know, mentioned already as well in their remarks, is that. Um, there is a significant need to better prepare local governments and local jurisdictions for this cybercrime threat. Um, they, locals need more support and need more resources to address cybersecurity. And this bill certainly would address that or uh, would really um, go a long way towards preparing local jurisdictions for the cybersecurity threat. The bill. Um, would uh, require that uh, Maryland Department of Information Technology, in conjunction with the Maryland Emergency Management Agency, uh, work with local uh, governments to uh, help them prepare for, create cybersecurity incident, uh, cyber incident response plans, um, help them um, uh, line up resources and trainings and exercises to better prepare them for um, cybersecurity incidents and response. So, you know, this is something, as I said, Michael and Greg have stressed, um, this is something that um, experts across the country have recognized as being a, a significant need, which is to, to better prepare locals um, for cybersecurity incidents. And this is, this is, that's why this bill is so important for Maryland, 
because it would establish that infrastructure, that coordination between the state and the local governments across the state to, to really, um, you know, create a, an environment that uh, would ensure the states and locals work closely together and uh, be better prepared for uh, the inevitable cyber incidents that are to come. Finally, uh, online consumer protection. Again, this is a trend we're seeing nationally. Um, as Greg mentioned, more and more consumers are concerned about how businesses are collecting their data and how they're using it. Um, it is often the case, uh, I think, in, for most people that they don't actually know what information is being collected about them and how it is being utilized by businesses who do that collection. The, the Online Consumer Protection Act that was introduced in the Maryland uh, legislature th this session um, is modeled after the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, as you might know, California was the first state to pass comprehensive online consumer protection through, through that law. Um, Virginia was the second state uh, in the country to pass a, an online consumer protection law um, this session. So there's now two states in the country that have um, dedicated laws to consumer protection and data collection. Um, we're also seeing, uh, I think about half of the states in the country introduce similar legislation. Although uh, in most states, you know, these, these bills have not become law. And you can see um, by the graphic again on the top of this slide that there's, there's, there's no chance of this bill becoming law in Maryland for this legislative session. Um, real quickly, it, the law, what it would do is basically uh, inform consumers and require businesses to get uh, consent from consumers before businesses start collecting personal information. Um, they would uh, require businesses to inform consumers about how the data that they're collecting is being shared. And it would give consumers the right to delete any data or request opt-outs or uh, opt out of any third party sharing. So these are significant consumer protection um, rights that would be established. But again, um, as you can see, this law, uh, this bill is, is not gonna become law this session. But I do uh, highlight it because there, it, it symbolizes a, a greater trend, I think, across the country. Um, these kinds of laws, as I mentioned, are being introduced across the country in state legislatures. I think it is only a matter of time before more of these laws are passed across the country, including here in Maryland. This bill will undoubtedly be back next legislative session. And I think more progress will be made on this front uh, across the country and in Maryland when it comes to uh, ensuring consumer protection through legislation. So um, I wanna highlight it because it's something to keep an eye on, something that's coming down the road. Um, and I think uh, exemplifies, like I said, a larger, a greater trend across the country. I will conclude there and uh, turn it back over to Greg. You're still on mute, Greg? Yeah, I'm, I'm used to face-to-face uh, -face conferences where all I got to do is talk <laughs> and don't have to drive. So, um, well, thank you, Marcus. Uh, and, uh, you know, both of us have been front row observers to um, uh, the action in the, in the Maryland legislature, and uh, you did a really good job. So thank you. So um, uh, uh, the three of us have done a lot of talking, and uh, so we'd like to go to the chat and entertain any questions that you have. Uh, we finished a little bit early. Um, uh, it's 9.44. The session goes to, uh, I think, 9, 9.55, if I'm, I'm correct. Uh, so we have uh, some time here to, um, to, to discuss uh, some questions. So let me go into the chat and um, kind of take them in the order in which uh, they have been raised. Uh, so I'm, I'm addressing the panel here. So uh, first question, uh, and I'm, I hope I'm, I'm reading this with the right emphasis. Um, so uh, good morning. Would you consider that there is a need for bills to facilitate enabling of Americans to take back control of their identities and, trans and transition of business process decisions 
from identity authentication for control to authorization by them directly for control of any business action, any business action that is a change of their tax refund addresses or verification of voting in real time. Um, so I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question. I think, I mean, fundamentally, um, I think uh, there's definitely a need um, for consumers and you know individuals to have more control over their uh, identities and their personal information when it comes to their online presence. I think um, you know, like I said, there's a ton of information being collected about all of us as we are uh, spending time online. Um, through you know our purchases, our purchase histories, our um, our internet browsing histories, and all that you know, all that information about our our behavior online is being is being gobbled up by by businesses and by um, data collection companies. And as consumers, we have little insight into what is being done with that information um, and. I think we, as consumers, we would like to have better transparency in terms of what's happening here and in terms of how our information is being used to create identities about us, um, create um, you know uh, profiles of us, and to have insight. And we as consumers would like more insight into that, I think, and um, have more control of that and and you know delete information if we'd like to or correct information if we'd like to, so that um, our uh, online identities are are the types of identities we want exposed, and also the types of identities um, that are that we feel comfortable, you know, having online. So um, definitely, more control needs to be. I, I, me speaking personally here, I think more control needs to be provided to consumers and individuals. Okay, well, thank you, Marcus, and um, uh, uh, hopefully that that addressed the question. Um, so another question, and uh, maybe start with you, uh, Michael, and, and then Marcus. Marcus, I know you teach uh, at the law school. Um, and the question is, uh, isn't there a federal law already that addresses collection, data collection on U.S. citizens? Yeah, so I think this was in relation to what Mark was saying about data privacy uh, and that there is not a federal data privacy law. And I think we're going to get into this into the uh, wrap around session that preempts all of, I, I think almost every state now has a um, data breach law or notification law, but there's not a privacy law. So what does that mean? Right now, every state about has a law in which if a company gets hit with a cyber attack and the criminal steals uh, information from their customers, they have to report to state government. There's not a federal law that mandates that right now. There is another aspect of this in terms of ensuring that consumers can tell a private entity, I don't want you to have X, Y, Z in my personal identifying information, whether that's your social security number, or your date of birth, your home address, your phone number, things of that nature. We're gradually seeing laws like in California, the Maryland bill that Marcus just mentioned, um, gain steam, and then the Virginia bill that just got passed, uh, but they all have different uh, requirements. Some are uh, a little more favorable to industry, some are a little more favorable to, to consumers, but right now there's not a federal law on that either. I think where there, where maybe you're, you're, you're suggesting is that right now the intelligence community cannot collect information on Americans. Now, this was the whole big deal with Evan Snowden and his revelations in terms of what was actually going on. Uh, so there were some uh, post Snowden, some requirements and, and laws that are passed to uh, stop the federal government from collecting um, private citizen data when it comes to communications and things of that nature. But we're, we're talking about something very, very much uh, differently from that. So that's why you see states acting uh, to help consumers, uh, because there isn't a federal law. Yeah, uh, Michael's completely 
right in, in answering that question. There is no single comprehensive federal data privacy law currently in existence. Um, what we're seeing are, again, various state laws, uh, like the California law or now the Virginia law, and attempts at uh, within other states to pass uh, data privacy laws, which the data privacy laws um, you know, are laws that would give more control to consumers about what types of information is collected about them and um, how that information is used. So there, again, there's no comprehensive um, federal law with respect to that. Um, and then as Michael mentioned, uh, there are these data breach notification laws, which exist uh, in every single state of the country, plus DC and some of the territories. Um, they're all independent. And uh, again, in this area, there is no single comprehensive uh, federal data breach notification law, which would create a single standard across the country for um, uh, requiring businesses or other entities to uh, notify the state's uh, government officials and consumers about any kind of data breach that they might have suffered. So, um, you know, we really, in these areas of, of cybersecurity and data privacy, we have uh, what's sometimes referred to as a patchwork of laws. Um, uh, and uh, because we have all these different, uh, different state laws addressing these issues. Uh, in addition, additionally, we might have, uh, we might actually have federal laws when it comes to certain industries, certain sectors. So healthcare sectors, financial sectors, you know, sometimes you can see a particular sector um, have particular uh, legal requirements in place for um, you know, notifications on data breaches or um, privacy protections. But again, this, this is all part of this patchwork of laws. We have state laws, we have some federal regulations uh, in certain cases, but there is no single comprehensive, you know, federal legislation that addresses these issues. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of work could be done at the federal level. Uh, well, thanks, Marcus. And I'm going to pitch one more question to you, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll uh, do our uh, our lightning round, and uh, I'll give you two minutes for this answer. Uh, so uh, this is about this is in reference to the uh, uh, the uh, ransomware bill, and the question is, what are your thoughts on how prosecutors will prove intent to deploy under the new ransomware bill? Uh, too high a hurdle to make a bill impactful? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And it's a question that um, definitely has come up in the committee as well. I think, um, I think there is a, there is a challenge at, uh, probably to, um, to really, um, you know, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that, uh, that someone is intending to use the software. Um, but then again, um, there really is no um, valid reason for using this types of software, this kind of malware. Um, there's no good, good intent or good uh, reason for having it. Um, you know, obviously the bill does make a, uh, an exception for research purposes. Um, so institutions um, that are doing research on this type of software are, are allowed to continue doing that research. Um, I think prosecutors are going to have to look at circumstantial evidence, um, you know, to see uh, what the intent might be of someone who's possessing this type of malware. Um, I do know um, state prosecutors are very much in favor of this bill. Um, they have said that it, it's a, it would provide a critical tool, to, additional tool for them to go after cyber criminals who are, um, you know, engaging in this type of uh, activity. So, um, you know, it, it might not be a, a perfect uh, solution and it might not prevent all ransomware attacks um, going forward, but I think anything that can be done to address this problem um, is, is good. And um, this, this bill certainly provides another tool in the toolbox for law enforcement. Um, and I will say uh, with, this, with this tool, it does make law or uh, prosecution the job of prosecutors is a little easier in that they don't actually have to show um, you know, actual harm um, to victims um, before they can prosecute. Uh, they might not have to do an intense forensics investigation where they 
have, they show, you know, the connection between the harm and the, and, and the attacker. They can really go after someone for just simply having that software with the intent to use it um, in the first place. So again, um, that's why state prosecutors are very much in favor of this bill and um, gives them another tool. But um, certainly won't, I, I don't anticipate that it'll stop every ransomware attack in the future, but it, it is certainly another step in the right direction. Okay, well, we're at time right now, Marcus. Thanks for that answer. Um, I don't know if they were going to cut us off or not, but so let's just go with a preemption question. Uh, the question here is whether um, Congress, uh, given what Michael said, kind of the acceleration of activity in this area, um, is going to preempt state action uh, in the cyber policy realm. So, uh, Michael, we'll start with you, then Marcus, and I'll um, back clean up. Yeah, I think right now, probably the one bill that we will see where state preemption might occur is a data breach law. And it's basically what Marcus said in that we have a patchwork framework and you have a lot of uh, businesses and industry who uh, have to deal with 55 different types of laws. And so it's very confusing, it's very burdensome, and it's very costly. So in, in the wake of SolarWinds and that you had a private company who willingly voluntarily said, I was breached, which then led everybody to understand the, the scope of it. There's a, now a need to say, okay, we, we actually need a data uh, breach law that'll be different from a data uh, or, or incident notification law. Those two are separate for now, but the challenge would be, do you take the strongest data breach law at the state level and make that the baseline? Or do you say you must have a minimum of this requirement and then any state can add on from that. And those are two approaches right now. I think where this might become an issue is the data privacy. I don't think Congress will tackle the data privacy issue quite yet. I think they're going to wait to see how the states uh, address it a bit more to see the kind of models are out there. The data privacy one, I think preemption won't occur, but it'll be a minimum floor. And then states can build up on top of that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Marcus, lightning round. <laughs> Just real quick, I think what everything Michael said is is true. I agree with him. I think um, you know where we might actually see some some federal preemption is in this data breach notification question. Um, it is an issue. It is an idea that has come up in the past, and states have been very much opposed to a federal standard. Um, states like California, which view themselves as having a very strong data breach notification law, so you know any any state that feels very uh, strongly about their law, uh, their version of law is not going to be uh, too happy with a federal law that might um, provide lesser standards. But I think, nonetheless, I think the burden on business is just too high to have to comply with 55 different laws, and we'll see some federal activity here. Mm. Okay. Um, I guess uh, my answer <clears throat> uh, is that, um, you know, uh, cybersecurity is bipartisan except when it's not. And uh, I think uh, to take the last session of Congress, it, uh, comparatively easy to pass bills that concern national security uh, or make organizational changes. Um, I think uh, so. So what I would say is, in general, uh, consumer protection is an area where states more will more or less have to themselves for the foreseeable future. Uh, and the reason is those bills. Um, uh, touch core business models of very powerful business interests uh, that will continue to make it difficult for uh, any level of government really uh, to have uh, meaningful legislation, uh, Congress included. Uh, con yeah, so for that reason, I think um, states will have the freedom to continue to, to struggle with this issue. So, um, uh, that's uh, actually we're over time. I uh, hope um, uh, it's been recorded. Let me mention that um, this session, uh, the recording of this session will be posted so you'll be able to uh, to stream it and download it or uh, reference it for others to stream and download. Uh, I'm sorry, to stream, not download. Um, we will also post our slides if you're interested in those, um, which you will be able to download. So we thank you very much for attending our session. Hopefully it was um, interesting and informative and uh, please enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.